um, give you an, a very, very warm welcome to this session, which is entitled Judge Rule is the law taking over politics and it's also my absolute pleasure to welcome you to the law strand so in this session in particular we've all seen the headlines about cats and prisoners not necessarily the same headlines but we want to try to get a little bit behind the headlines in this session and we we want to ask the question does empowering judges undermine democracy or does it provide necessary checks and balances, making sure that we protect the minority against an overbearing majority? That's the question, and I've got an absolutely stunningly well-qualified platform to answer that question, which thankfully I don't need to answer. So I'll introduce the panel in the order in which they're going to speak. And first of all, we have Emily Thornbury on my right who has been Shadow Attorney General since 2011. And what's more, um, as if that didn't qualify her well enough, before entering Parliament, she practised as a human rights barrister in none other than Mike Mansfield's chambers. So we're delighted to have Emily here. And on my left, we have another very well uh, qualified um, panellist. We have Anthony Spate, QC who has been a barrister, I think, for 40 years. And what's more, is a member of the Executive Committee of the Society of Conservative Lawyers and the author of a very relevant pamphlet here, which is entitled A Call for a Conservative Intellectual Revival in Law and Human Rights. So we're delighted to have Anthony. Thirdly, we have, over here on my far right, we have <coughs> Gavin Philipson, who is Professor of Law at Durham University. And his research interests lie very pertinently in the fields, field of UK human rights law, and particularly the judicial role in protecting human rights. What's more, he's the author of no less than three books, with a fourth one due out next year, which I'm very much looking forward to seeing, which is entitled Debating hate speech and is in fact a debate about hate speech. So welcome to Gavin. And finally, on my far left, we have John Holbrook, who is a leading public, public law barrister and what's more regular contributor to Spiked, an online magazine, as well as the New Law Journal. This year, he's been shortlisted, he was shortlisted for the Legal Journalism Award by Halsbury Publishers. And he bills himself, perhaps unusually, as a lawyer who wants less law. So that's the panel. Shall we welcome them? So I'd like to invite Emily Thornbury to speak first. There's a, there's a new buzz, buzz phrase which is going around. Um, it's called judicial activism. And, um, and it's, sort of, it's, it's, it's ricocheting around the world. And to a certain extent, there's something in it. Um, if you look around the world, there are kind of lots of examples of judges getting involved right in the middle of kind of, of, of meaty political issues. So, yeah, nothing less than working out the legality of the United States presidential elections or the legality of the Musharraf coup in Pakistan, um, Germany's place in the EU, the war in Chechnya, the role of secularism in, uh, in Turkey. So across the world, it seems as though judges are kind of entering the political arena. You'll see from that list that I don't include any particularly meaty issues in relation to British judges. Now, it's right to say that obviously there are times when issues seem to be too difficult, too hard, too hot for politicians in the UK to deal with. And so they set up a, a body outside the current legal system, uh, which is you know, to get a judge to do a judge-led inquiry. You'll hear it from the public all the time. Whenever there's anything and they want to have a decision made, they go, we want a judge-led inquiry, we want a judicial inquiry, we want an independent public inquiry led by a judge. It's as if, it's as if in Westminster, you know, we have so little confidence in ourselves, and indeed the public have so little confidence in us, that when it comes to really important decisions, we'd like Leveson to deal with it, or we'd like Chilcot to deal with it. We don't want to deal with it ourselves in Westminster. But, but I want to just make a very important point, that that is a system which politicians themselves have established. 
It's times when we find it too hard and we hand over the, judge, the job to judges. We have at the moment a, a, an onslaught, frankly, by this Tory government on the judiciary itself, it seems to me, and in its more traditional roles. I find it quite ironic because I have to say, when I was a student, um, one of the most um, influential books at the time was a book by Griffiths, which was called The Politics of the Judiciary. And it was basically all about how right-wing judges were, how they were public schoolboys, how they couldn't be trusted. You know, and indeed, when there, was a, when there was a move to introduce the Human Rights Act um, into the UK to bring the Strasbourg law um, into, into the heart of our, of our legal system, there were many people, particularly you know, a lot of, of left-wing theorists at the LSE, who said, absolutely not, we can't trust judges with the Human Rights Act. There are a bunch of reactionary so-and-sos, and they will just spend their time cutting and nipping and pushing and, and restricting the Human Rights Act. So where are we now? I think that we are actually in a system where our judges, our British system of judges, does not have a system where we have judicial activism of the, of the sort that you get in many other countries. In fact, I think that we have a system where our judges are very deferential to the idea that Parliament is supreme. When you, get, uh, when you want to challenge a, a decision made by, made by uh, politicians, people often say, oh, I'm going off for judicial review. But what you don't get if you go off for a judicial review is it's very difficult to actually challenge the policy itself. You can't say, I don't like HS2, therefore I'm going to challenge it in the courts. What you have to do is go around the edge of it, which is, has the decision been made in a way which is rational? Has it been made in a way which is fair? Have they been consulting properly? It's very much a sort of process. And if the process has been right, then you cannot, in my view, on the whole in the UK, challenge the substance of the policy itself, unlike in other countries. And that has been our system, and that is as far as we have got. But I think that this Tory government is jumping on the back of the ricocheting phrase, judicial activism, and is trying to attack our judiciary at its core. The judiciary have a tool in the Human Rights Act, and all they're doing, all they're doing, is, is clipping the wings of Parliament when Parliament goes too far. When Parliament, when Parliament passes something, or, or the executive makes a decision which, which attacks a minority right when it's not fair to do so. So, you know, so yeah, you know, a couple of gay people go to a bed and breakfast and the, and the landlord of the bed and breakfast says, you were not gonna let you in, you're gay. You yeah, well, that's contrary to the Human Rights Act. You know, hello? If this is not judicial activism, this is just judges applying the law and making the Human Rights Act a living document in the middle of our, of our legal system, whereby people are to have basic, basic human rights that apply to all of us. Even the scary ones, even the, even, the, even the ones with big beards, even the people that we don't particularly like, you know, even travellers who are doing God knows what in your local car park, we, are, we, are, we all have certain basic rights and the courts have an obligation to, to enforce those rights. And that seems to me not to be judicial activism, but simply all about equality and fairness and equity, which, you know, if the law isn't about that, what is it about? What is it about? And so I think that we've actually got to the stage where we have a Tory government that is, that is in a way behaving like a, a slightly desperate opposition. You know, desperate oppositions in the run-up to an election start making more and more irrational and ridiculous and outstandingly stupid suggestions just in order to be able to get people's attention, in order to be able to get the attention of the media and the attention of the public, and obviously in this case, the attention of people who might be thinking of voting UKIP. And in order to be able to try and get their attention, they go, hey, look, we've got £7 billion. We just found it in the back of our pocket. We can give you all tax cuts. That is irrational and stupid and not based on facts. But it is, a, it is the behaviour of a desperate government that is behaving like a desperate opposition in order to try to win the election. And just like they have £7 billion in this back pocket, in this back pocket, they have, we've got a British Bill of Rights. But we've been saying to them for years, you want a British Bill of Rights? Tell us what you want to have in it. And all that anyone has ever really been able to agree with is Human Rights Act, can't really disagree with that. Let's add on to it, possibly as a max. Let's add on a right to, what does that mean? I've got one minute. Um, let's get a, a, a right to, uh, to, to, to jury trial. But further than that, what are we talking about? But instead, what the, what the Tories have said is, we will have a British Bill of Rights. It will be the Human Rights Act. But what we will do is we will make sure it doesn't apply to everybody. It won't apply to those that we don't like. It won't apply to, to travellers, they've specifically said. It won't apply to foreign criminals. 
You know, and what they're trying to do is they're saying, we won't, have, we won't have trivial cases. Well, who says what a trivial case is? Is a judge going to be expected to make that? And if a judge is supposed to be making that sort of decision, they will then turn around if they don't get a decision they like and say, the judges are being political. The people who are making the judges political are those who are trying to nip and tuck our Human Rights Act and trying to restrict it, and then setting up in battle with the, with the European Court of Human Rights. There will be a battle royal if the, Euro if the British Bill of Privileges is introduced in this, in, in our, into our country, and the judges will be put on the front line, and we will see them becoming political in a way that they have not been seen to be political until now. It is dangerous, and it is reckless, and it should be stopped. <laughs> Should we be wary of political activism? My answer, yes. To explain, I need to give some actual examples. First, concerns questioning of complainants in rape trials about their past sexual conduct. Uh, for many years, it was the case that this could only be done with the permission of the judge. In 1999, Parliament thought that the judges were allowing this too readily. And Parliament decided to introduce a detailed framework. Uh, along came a case where the courts felt that this framework was too restrictive and produced unfairness for the particular accused, and indeed in a lot of other circumstances might have done. And for reasons which were well explained, and I have some sympathy with, the House of Lords uh, uh, decided, as I say, that the framework produced unfairness. What to do? One thing the House of Lords could have done would be to make a formal declaration of incompatibility with convention rights uh, under the Human Rights Act. But it chose to do something else. It used the provision which enables the court, if possible, to give effect to legislation compatibly with convention rights one of which is fair trial. Now, although the wording of the Act was, in the words of the leading textbook, clear and unambiguous the other way, the judges decided that it was possible to read it so that the judge could allow questions if he thought fit. In other words, after Parliament had decided that the judges couldn't be trusted to handle this, the judges said, well, we're going to go on doing it our way anyway. Second example concerned Naomi Campbell, the model. The Daily Mirror ran an article that she was attending Narcotics Anonymous and they had a photograph of her going in. She said that this was an unlawful intrusion and she sued. The case went all the way up to the House of Lords and she won. In accordance with English practice, the Mirror, as the loser, had to pay her costs. About three quarters of a million after all that litigation, normal base costs, plus, a quarter of a million success fee under a no-win, no-fee arrangement. The Mirror then went to Strasbourg and succeeded in persuading the European Court of Human Rights that the law that required them to pay this success fee, which is a law which Parliament had introduced, again, actually, in 1999, <coughs> <coughs> the mirrors Article 10 right to freedom of expression. How did the judges reach that conclusion? They held that the UK law was not necessary in a democratic society. Third example, about life imprisonment. It's the mandatory sentence for murder. Most convicted murderers are, in fact, released uh, some time. But in a very small minority of cases of the most horrific murders, uh, about 1% of prisoners serving life sentences, uh, the court <coughs> makes, uh, can make, so say about 1% does make, a, an order for a whole life tariff, <coughs> i.e. life meaning life. And the current practice is that in these cases, the Home Secretary will only release on compassionate grounds in terminal illness. The Strasbourg Court last year held that there must always be a review. In one sense, that's just procedural. But the reasoning <coughs> that they explained was that any life sentence 
must have a prospect of release, not just on the compassionate grounds. Otherwise, it would be a breach of Article 3, which reads, no one shall be subjected to torture or to inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Now, bearing in mind that the Convention didn't outlaw the death penalty, it's rather surprising that it held that its wording outlawed life imprisonment. Fourth case. For the last couple of years, the EU institutions have been discussing a new data protection law. One issue is the so-called right to be forgotten. In other words, if there's a search on a person's name that, through a search engine, leads to information which is accurate and was lawfully published, but which the person doesn't want to be seen, should the person, after a number of years, have the right to require the link to be expunged. A complex issue, technically and in principle. Pitches privacy on the one hand against freedom of information on the other. And do we want to censor searches in Europe which can be freely made elsewhere in the world? As yet, no agreement has been reached in the EU on new legislation. Enter the EU court. <coughs> in May, it held that there is already a right to be forgotten in EU law. It reached that conclusion by holding that Google, which is actually an indexing system with no control over the sites it links to, was a data controller. Simon Hughes, our relevant UK minister, described the outcome as a nonsense. House of Lords Select Committee, much the same, misguided in principle and unworkable in practice. Now, these four cases illustrate a wider trend. And the pattern you see in all of them is judges favoring some particular policy outcome, perhaps for very good reasons, which you might or might not agree with it. Then they force the meaning of words, and they seize the role which in a democratic society ought to be played by parliament. And because pushed and unnatural meanings are unexpected, this erodes the concept of the rule of law of which the very first characteristic is that law should be predictable and certain. It's no solution to say run away from this by getting out of Europe. Judges at home might become just as bad. The only solution is to defeat judicial activism on the plane of ideas by persuading people that it is contrary to our fundamental values. And that is why I am very grateful to the battle of ideas for giving me the opportunity to express this view. <clears throat> very clear difference of opinion there. Over to Gavin. Thanks, Helen. Well, I'm going to, like the other speakers, focus on the extent of judicial protection for our basic human rights, because I think that's where most of the controversies arise. First point I want to make is to try and to put into some kind of international or comparative perspective the seeming moral panic, which I think is mainly on the right, about the judges taking over politics, by looking at how the UK fares when compared to other democracies abroad. If we do that, we're presented with a very clear conclusion. In the UK, because of our system of parliamentary sovereignty and the fact that we have no written constitution to enforce, our judges actually have very limited power. Unlike in the United States or Germany, our, court, our judges cannot strike down acts of parliament for violating constitutional rights. And in fact, systematic comparative surveys clearly demonstrate that out of all the world's democracies, only Australia and New Zealand, and perhaps Israel, have weaker protection for basic rights than we do. Other than those countries, then, every other liberal democracy in the world has considerably stronger legal protection for basic rights than the UK. So my first point is simply to get this in some kind of perspective, this panic about the judges taking over politics. My second is that, in general, our <coughs> judiciary are notably restrained. Um, Anthony Spade, in fact, cited one of the few cases that is seen as an example of activism, the, the Rape Shield case. If anything, the record, the overall record of particularly our top courts, the House of Lords as it was, 
tends to be to defer too much of anything to the views of the government on what restrictions our rights on our rights are necessary. <coughs> and this has been so even since our courts were given their new powers under the Human Rights Act in 1998. They've often been so timid in their rulings that the European Court of Human Rights has found that they've fallen short in protecting basic rights. And I'll give you three very quick examples. The first is the Gillen case, in which the House of Lords had to consider the power Parliament had handed the police, since discredited, to stop and search anyone without any reasonable suspicion on the grounds that they may have committed terrorism offences or be carrying terrorist-related um, items. Although meant to be applied only for 28 days at a time in a particular location in response to a particular threat in that location, it had in fact been applied continuously from early 2001 on for over eight years throughout the entire location of Greater London under a succession of continuously maintained rolling authorizations. And of course, as we all now know, it was used in the most blatantly discriminatory way. When the power was challenged by a journalist who was stopped and searched when um, attending a demonstration, the UK courts found no reason to think that this kind of effectively random stop and search infringed any of our rights. Indeed, the House of Lords was so anxious to defer to the arguments of national security that they failed to ask proper searching questions as to whether this extraordinary power was really necessary, reasonable, or proportionate in terms of an intrusion into privacy. In contrast, when the case went to Strasbourg, the court had no hesitation in finding a breach of the right to privacy. Indeed, so deficient was the scheme the court found in handing effectively arbitrary powers to interfere with liberty to the police that it could not even be regarded as constrained by anything they thought could be called law, the most basic test that any measure must pass. It was a piece of arbitrary power that Parliament had granted, the police had used to the widest possible extent, and our courts had been so deferential that they had failed to uphold even basic rule of law standards. The same thing happened over the DNA database, my second example. Our highest courts were so blasé over the government practice of taking and retaining DNA from everyone arrested, regardless of whether they were charged, let alone convicted, that most of our judges thought it didn't even raise an issue in relation to the right to private life, let alone violate it. Again, Strasbourg was unanimous. The policy clearly violated the right to private life. And thirdly, secret evidence. Again, the House of Lords had been unable to find that when imposing <coughs> draconian control orders on people who'd never been found guilty of any offence, that the suspect had the basic right to hear the bare minimum of the case against them. Once again, Strasbourg was clear that the right to a fair trial required such minimum disclosure of the case against you. So if anything, our problem has been that our courts have been too reluctant to use even the relatively modest powers that they've been granted by Parliament to protect our basic rights, although of course there have been some more assertive decisions. But, and this is my third and final point, even the modest protection that the courts have afforded have been too much for some of our politicians who find the imposition of any, any real check upon their draconian and often irrational decisions intolerable and respond, as we know, by telling open lies about decisions, such as Theresa's May, Theresa May's notorious lie about someone not being deported because of a cat. So now we have the golden future promised by our UKIP and now by the Conservatives, where the human rights you can enforce in a British court will no longer be internationally agreed standards policed by an international court standing apart from the short-term political fads and moral panics of any particular country. Mm -hmm. Instead, you'll be granted only those rights that politicians are prepared to dole out to you, rights with special limitations written into them by politicians to appease the right wing and avoid the wrath of the Daily Mail and with weakened rights of protection. Yeah. Meanwhile, the government is going to go to the Council of Europe and say what? That alone amongst the 48 states governed by the European Convention on Human Rights and contrary to the clear terms of the treaty that this country has signed, court rulings against the UK alone should be treated as advisory and not as binding. No one believes that other states will agree to that. So perhaps the government idea is to try and change the whole system so that no country anymore is bound by rulings of the European, uh, of the European Court of Human Rights. What would be an astonishing act of international vandalism yeah. to bring down the entire edifice of European human rights protection simply to suit the political views of the Conservative Party. It may be that this is just window dressing and it's just tended now to appease um, UKIP and give the Tories some cover on their right. But if that's, what they, if that's what they're assuming, if that's what they really would try and do, the only eventual outcome could be the option that is floated, that assuming that other European states remain sane and don't agree to destroy the edifice of European human rights laws to please the British Conservative Party, the government would propose then that we join Belarus and draw completely from our European obligations to protect human rights. So I conclude, if you care about human rights, and particularly the rights of the poor, the demonised, the foreigner, the terror suspect, I'll say what I think, what I think we should be doing. Far from attacking the role of law in protecting our basic human rights,
we should be celebrating and affirming it and getting ready for the fight of our lives to stop what the Tories and UKIP want, to leave your rights in the gift of a bare majority in the House of Commons, itself elected on a minority of the vote and terrified of the latest bigoted and ignorant editorial in the Daily Mail and the latest speech by Nigel Farage. Farage. We're not confronted with the threat of the law taking over politics, but rather with the very real possibility of the basest politics of fear and xenophobia taking over and destroying our human <coughs> rights. Thank you. Which of these three issues is a legal issue? Assisted suicide, prisoners voting, the welfare benefit cap. I ask that question in order to draw attention to this problem. None of those three issues is a legal issue, not one of them. And yet each of those three issues has been fought out in the Supreme Court over the last 12 months. Assisted suicide, of course, we know of the case of Nicholson and Martin. Prisoners voting, perhaps not so well known, but a year ago the Supreme Court in the case of Chester said that Strasbourg jurisprudence applies here and hence that the policy that this government has, on, or successive governments actually, on prisoners not being allowed to vote was unlawful. And the welfare benefit cap, we're waiting for a judgment in that case now. And those issues have been fought out in the Supreme Court, not on a narrow issue, of Parliament has passed these laws, what do the laws mean? Oh no, the issue taken to the Supreme Court in each of those cases has been the fundamental one of Parliament has passed these laws, are those laws lawful? For anyone who believes in democracy, to me, this is a profound problem. It's a profound problem because the constitutional balance between politics and law has broken down. The way it ought to work, and the way it has traditionally worked, is that it is for Parliament to make the laws, and it is for the judiciary to interpret them and apply them. That is no longer the case. Our judiciary now, because of laws incidentally which Parliament has given them, now has the ability to pass judgment on those laws, to decide whether or not they are binding, to decide whether or not they are right or wrong. And as a believer in democracy, I find this profoundly troubling. The reason why it troubles me is because it seems to me that it challenges the very notion of what it is to live in a democratic society. There is far more to being in a democratic society than merely being able to vote once every five years, although that is actually very important. But what, the reason why it troubles me is because the way that these political, these public policy issues ought to be resolved is being profoundly changed by taking these issues away from Parliament and putting them into the legal sphere. There are three ways in which the different approaches uh, can be shown to be so different. First of all, when it comes to deciding a matter in the political sphere, politicians certainly always ought to start with the vision, the big picture. What sort of society is it that we want? How are we going to achieve that? And once you've established those foundational principles, those underlying values, then you can apply those to a particular policy, and hence you formulate the policy on the basis of those principles. When it comes to law and resolving these issues in the courts, that's never how it happens. You don't start with your blank sheet. You don't start by asking the big foundational questions. Oh, no. You have to make legal submissions on the basis of what the legal framework allows you to argue. You try and resolve these questions not by asking the big questions, but by looking to precedent. What have judges of yesterday or 10 years ago decided? And that, it seems to me, is a fundamental problem with the way these policy <coughs> issues are, are being resolved, which actually means that you end up with some pretty potty public policy decisions being made by judges because they are constrained within an existing legal framework. The second uh, way in which uh, it, it, it's problematic is because when you do resolve things in the political sphere, politicians are concerned to engage with the people they have their vision, they have their ideas, they have their values, they have their policies. They present them to the public. There is an engagement, there is a public debate that goes on. Politicians are forced to refine their arguments, to see in what ways they can be improved. It doesn't happen like that when you take these issues into courts. Oh no, there's no public engagement. The only engagement is with one judge. 
maybe three, occasionally five, very occasionally a few more. But public engagement is not an issue when these issues are resolved in courts. And the third important feature about the difference between the way these issues can be resolved is the issue of consent. Because following on from what I've just said about the need for public engagement, it also follows that politicians need to govern by consent. That is a very important part of democracy. Winning the arguments, uh, ensuring that a majority of people are supportive of what you are doing. When it comes to arguing cases in court and making dis decisions in a judicial framework, consent's got nothing to do with it. The judge lays down the law, and the law will always win. <coughs> It doesn't matter whether that law is popular, it doesn't matter whether the majority of people support it or not. And we know that as well from the issues of prisoners voting and certainly the welfare benefit cap policies, uh, which are very popular. Uh, but the courts are not troubled by that. That they can, because they have ultimately a coercive role, disregard the will of the people. So what, what this uh, has resulted in is the problem of judicial activism. And it is a problem, it seems to me, which has developed because of a rather narrow elite strata of society has given up on the notion of winning public consent, of engaging with the people. And what you have is a rather elite-led campaign, often led by lawyers, but supported by a great many campaigning organisations, who have lost touch with the broad base of society. They're not concerned about engaging with the people. They'd much rather go to court and instruct their lawyers with their wigs and gowns to make legal submissions. They don't mind whether or not their policies have public support. They're quite content to ask the judge to lay down the law and whether or not the public support these policies, it doesn't matter. This is a policy which has been driven by an elite, middle-class strata of society which has lost touch with the broad base um, that, that any sort of political movement ought to have. It really troubles me. Um, it, 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 is a, it is a profound uh, turning upside down of the proper constitutional relationship. What we need to have is a debate whereby we can get back to a state of affairs where it is for politicians to decide on policy, it is for politicians to make the laws, and the judicial role needs to be confined solely to understanding those laws, interpreting them, and applying them. Um, to the panel for laying out the issues so incredibly beautifully and also of course for um, keeping to time so beautifully which leads us lots of um, opportunity for discussion. I'm just going to start by throwing a few questions um, to the panel myself and then I'll um, very soon throw things out to the audience to see what you think. And I think what was really, um, it's a complicated debate and there were lots of views put forward but what for me came out beautifully clearly um, in the whole panel really is one kind of overriding question um, with two um, clear sides. On one side, um, what's being said is judicial activism, lots of change, judges basically um, taking policy decisions for themselves. And on the other side, we heard very clearly nothing really, um, nothing going on here. You know, nothing exceptional, um, judges applying the law. What else would you expect in a democracy? So I just wanted to start, and really I've got the same question actually, that. I want to ask to um, both Emily and Gavin and, and in different ways and hear your views on. Um, I mean, particularly when I was listening to you, Emily, it, sound, it felt to me like I was back studying law in, in the 80s because you were saying, you know, it's, judges can't change policy, it's all about process, not substance, it's simply whether the procedure's being followed. And that was all very familiar to me from studying judicial review um, years ago. And, I mean, can that really be right that so little has changed? We've had, you know, the phenomenal, um, enormous um, change of the Human Rights Act and everything that's followed it. And yet, listening to you, it sounded as if, oh, it's all just business as usual. I think, I think the, I think some of the examples that have been that have been used have been quite striking, but don't necessarily stand up to a great deal of of, uh, of careful looking at. So, for example, it's been put forward that um, the courts don't need to be troubled by the benefit cap, um, and yet you've said yourself that the courts have yet to make a decision on that. Um, you said that the courts are making decisions about um, assisted um, suicide, and yet the Supreme Court made it quite clear that since there was going to be a debate in the House of Lords on the issue of assisted suicide and 
um, and the right to life. They, that they would, did not at that stage feel that it was appropriate for them to lay down any conditions at that point. It's, I mean, I mean, the right to life, when people can, when people can die, who can assist them, who can't assist them, the legality of that is a hot potato that nobody really wants to make a decision about. And I don't think it's fair to say that the judges have been, I mean, they, if you're a judge and, you're, and you've got people coming in front of you and saying, well, is the decision this or is the decision that, it's quite difficult to actually finesse that and say, I'm really not going to make a decision on that. Um, but that's kind of what the Supreme Court has been doing in relation to assisted dying, it seems to me. And they were saying, well, you know, the, um, the, there was, um, I can't remember who it was, who it was, there was a debate anyway in the House of Lords, you know, within a few weeks, um, a Faulkner's, but Faulkner's bill was coming up in a few weeks. And so they were saying, well, you know, we'll make a decision in a limited way on this, but we can't really make major decisions on this. This really is a decision for Parliament. And that seemed to me kind of quite a good way of showing the deference that the Supreme Court shows to Parliament, the, the relationship between Parliament and the, and the judges. I mean, of course things have changed in terms of, and, I, and I'd said that, in relation to hu the Human Rights Act and the fact that it's a living, breathing document in the middle of our, of our legal system. And the judges have, have to go further in terms of if the rights of a minority are being trampled on, then, we, then they have to kind of try and do a checks and balances exercise in relation to that. And also the, the, the rather benign Wensbury principle of unreasonableness has, has been tweaked a bit, and now the word is irrational, which I think kind of upsets you know, politicians a bit. Listen, no politician wants to be judicially reviewed. You know, I've not been a minister, but my friends who've been ministers, this is absolutely awful being judicially reviewed. It's humiliating and difficult, and you just don't want to do it. And of course, the answer is to make decisions better. You know, because judicial review doesn't just happen in terms of, 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 the, of the policy, but it also happens in terms of challenging the executive on day-to-day -day decisions that the executive make. Mm -hmm. And actually, when we have such a, such a weak parliament in terms of holding the executive to account, where do we get that check and balance? We have to go, we have to go back to the judiciary. Mm -hmm. Gavin, I think I'll come to you in a moment to see what you think about that, because Anthony, I wanted to give you the opportunity. Now, of course, you're here speaking in your per personally. You're not here to represent any um, political point of view, but quite a few things were said about the Conservative um, proposals, and I just wanted to give you the opportunity to comment, if you wish to, about those You mean proposals. about uh, Chris Grayling's uh, uh, yes, policy Yes, I mean, they paper. were mentioned, really, um, by both speakers. I mean, firstly, I I've, I've had absolutely nothing to do with Chris Grayling's policy paper. Uh, secondly, if I had been involved in writing it, if I'd, certainly if I'd been the author of any such document, it would have had a rather different tone, particularly in the underlying tone towards Europe. Yeah. I've marched for a united Europe, I've all night vigiled for a united Europe, and I shall be campaigning to stay in the EU next year, if for 2017, if there is a referendum. So I am. I, I, I am not someone who has any discomfort about us being in European organizations. But as to what the policy document means, uh, as a conservative-minded lawyer who reads the words for their ordinary and natural meaning, I have to say I have extracted from the document a different meaning from that which others have. And I do not read it as announcing a policy of wanting uh, either to leave the mm, Convention well. on Human Rights uh, or as uh, wanting the whole convention to be changed. Um, this is a rather sterile discussion mm. as we have the words up on the board and analyze what they say, but I, I simply read it as uh, focusing a sharper spotlight on what is the present status quo, which is that Strasbourg decisions are not self-executing in this country, unlike decisions of the uh, Luxembourg Court, the EU. Uh, they, are, uh, they create treaty obligations, and we comply <coughs> with treaty obligations by changing uh, the laws in Parliament if, uh, if a treaty obligation requires that. So I, I, I read the document as, um, uh, as I say, as... Um, uh, I, it's, it's not the packaging that I put around something, but uh, mm. not amounting to any very major change. But, but, but just, uh, 
just firing a, a certain warning shot, perhaps. Uh, and I would, I personally, I would have wished it more, uh, more clearly to deal with the issue of the jurisprudence of the court, mm. the, 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 the judicial philosophy, which to my mind is the central issue. Um, uh, but insofar as it's in a roundabout way focused attention on that, I, I, I welcome the fact that it has drawn uh, uh, attention and generated some debate about the fact that judges are on occasions, not always, but on occasions, in order to achieve a policy outcome that they like, forcing the meaning of words mm. to meanings that they don't really have and intervening in very complex policy areas which should be sorted out in a democratic society by a legislature. Mm. I mean, isn't that right, Gavin, that there's a forcing there, there's forcing uh, meaning into words that it really can't, that they really can't bear. You, you sort of gave this picture of a very constrained judiciary, um, just really uh, providing a check on politicians, but it's much more than that, isn't it? Well, the, everyone can select examples that, that, that suit their own side, and some but people call this to debate there, the, the word examples. Just to follow on from um, but I, I, I will actually, I will actually, I wanted to address Anthony's, I mean, that, that particular that particular case, um, to do with the, the rape shield case, where, where indeed the House of Lords did reread the legislation in a rather startling way that appeared to be clearly contrary to what Parliament intended. I mean, I'd simply emphasise that's, that's one case out of about 50 in which that power to reread legislation um, has been used. But isn't the it's point very that much they've the got exception. that power? They do have that power, but the point is when they've they exercised it in, in, in a restrained way, and it's only an interpretive power. So in, in the pantheon of, of power around the world, where many courts have the power to strike down legislation, it's still only a power to reinterpret legislation. And in many cases, the courts have said, we cannot, in fact, reinterpret legislation, even though we could linguistically, because we think precisely that this is a big, complex issue that should be handed back to Parliament to deal with. For mm -hmm. example, in the case of... Um, of gender reassignment. Mm. The, other thing I'd, the other thing I'd just add about that is that if, if in that, that happened in 1999, if a, if a court reinterprets legislation so it means something contrary to what Parliament wanted it to mean, Parliament could reenact the legislation with the original meaning. It mm. chose not to do so. It's a dialogic relationship between courts That's and Parliament. True. Parliament can always respond. Parliament, for whatever reason, decided not to respond to that case, even though it wasn't actually very clearly buttressed by Strasbourg case law. The government could have thought they might go to Strasbourg and win that case. Mm. Um, the government and Parliament therefore chose to acquiesce in the judicial ruling, but that's their choice. Mm. In our system, under the Human Rights Act, Parliament always does, in fact, have the last word. Mm. John, I want to go over to the audience in a minute, so if you could answer this briefly. I mean, I feel a bit between a rock and a hard place here because we're starting to focus in on the very controversial um, rape <coughs> shield judgment, and we obviously don't want to get into the nitty-gritty of that. But I have to say, I'm one of the people who really likes that judgment in its substance, probably one of the few people. Um, so what I wanted to ask you is, you know, these are really, a lot, lots of these are really good decisions, aren't they, that the judges are making? They're, they're upholding principles of equality, fairness, justice, the right to a fair trial. Isn't that a positive development? Uh, a lot the of people say that. Good. Uh, a lot of people do say that. And uh, I do find, actually, that a lot of people who support human rights legislation actually support it because, on the whole, they like the decisions which are coming out of Strasbourg. Now, that's not the way you should look at this. You should look at the issue uh, from the question of principle. Is it right that judges have these powers? Uh, the fact that uh, the, the example that's often given is the one of gays in the military um, and how, without human rights legislation, the judiciary would have had trouble um, overturning the, the discriminatory practice against gays joining the military. Um, my point about that, and incidentally, I, 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 I support the, the reforms that, that came about, uh, but my point about that is one of process. If you believe in something, so if you believe in equality, if you believe in equal rights for all, as I do, then have that debate with the public. Convince people that it is necessary to change the law. And if you are right, and there is a democratic groundswell of support in favour of changing the law, then it will happen. And history tells us. You know, you go back to the reforms in the 60s right through to the present day. There will always be reforms when there is a political demand for it. And what I would ask is why is it that all these campaigners who like these decisions that are coming out of Strasbourg, why do they not have the intellectual ability or even the inclination to take their arguments out to the public? Why are they content to try and persuade the judge to tell us what the law is? Big question. OK, so now it's your turn. I'd just like to ask one question, first of all, and then make a brief comment. And the question is, should Parliament respond to Strasbourg's instruction 
the prisoners should have the right to vote in this country? That's my question. My comment is, I think Gavin said something about uh, we, should protect, we should defend the existing system if we care about rights. Uh, implying that those who don't defend the existing system don't care about rights. So it's precisely because I do really care about rights that I think there's major problems with the current system. I really support the right to free speech, fundamental free speech. And who should I look to to uh, protect that right? Now, I could look to the European Convention of Human Rights. If you actually read that document, it is a fundamentally flawed document in relation to uh, freedom of speech. It has so many caveats that essentially it doesn't actually support freedom of expression at all. It supports the right of governments to limit freedom of expression. And indeed, when free speech issues have gone to the court, often they've not ruled in favour of free speech, such as in a recent case about uh, political advertising. So should I look to the courts to defend that right? No. Sadly, I can't look to political parties either in this country, the mainstream ones, because none of them do support free speech. And that also review, reveals the limitation of the proposed Bill of Rights, the UK Bill of Rights, because I don't believe any of the parties will actually support free speech in that Bill of Rights. So where do I go? I would suggest that, uh, as John said, actually the only thing to do if I support that right is to campaign for it, and campaign for it democratically, and try and insist that our MPs actually have the courage of traditional values traditional enlightenment values defend free speech. And I think the only statement that really uh, applies ultimately here is the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. The price of liberty is not eternally looking to judges to maybe, possibly, uphold rights. Thank you. Surprised to hear Emily say that her colleagues don't like being ju judicially reviewed because it seems to me that a really important component in this discussion is the legislature and the kind of powers that the legislature are granting themselves. So I'll give you two recent examples. One which is close to my heart, which is Lewisham <laughs> Hospital had an A&E which um, wasn't failing, um, but another local A&E, which was in a different uh, local authority area, um, had a f their own department which was failing. And I hadn't quite realised before I looked at this case just how much um, a minister has to do in order to make the decision to close an A&E or put, them in, put it into a, the equivalent of special measures. There's a whole series of steps that this minister has to go through in order to lawfully make the decision um, to close a particular department. So it strikes me that that's law that Parliament has drafted. It's drafted it for itself. Um, and it's given itself incredibly qualified powers. So that is inherently vulnerable to judicial review. So um, in, that, in that case, the High Court stepped in, quashed his decision, declared it unlawful. But they were only able to do that because the power itself is so heavily qualified. Yeah. Another quick example is um, the recent legal aid reforms. Um, so Chris Grayling's legal aid reforms have just been struck down. Why? Because he failed to consult on a single document that he had put out for expert opinion. So the real heart of this, I think, is a legislature which is completely incapable of making decisions of their own volition. There's about five or six different experts involved in each one of these decisions, and if they fail to consult properly on any one of them, their decision can be struck down by the court. Mm. So surely that's a, it's, it's another way of looking at the discussion, not blaming the judiciary, but actually blaming the legislature for giving themselves such qualified powers. Thank you. I think maybe two quick questions. Um, one, I'm a layperson, not a lawyer, um, and I have to say when I hear the term human right, I'm never really quite clear what that means it does seem a, a general term. You know, it, it, you know, people go, you know, child, uh, people demonstrating for education, it's a human right. It seems to be what I want seems to be the human right. And uh, is that a difficulty? So, for example, in the bed and breakfast case, when you might say, well, I have a human right to have my sexuality you know, fully realised against a human right of having Christian consciousness. You know, is, that, is that the problem mm -hmm. that you face once you're... Um, making law around human yeah. rights because one person's right to be human and yeah. realise that yeah. maybe against another person's understanding. And the yeah. other question was just certainly Emily and Gavin, UKIP seems to be causing great dread to you and, and, and uh, maybe um, I'm bastardising what you say, but there does seem to be an element saying rather than this acknowledging what UKIP might say and, and the populace, populism of UKIP, we will look to the law. We don't want to have that argument 
And I guess sometimes in a democracy, things may happen in that society which you know, aren't as nice as they should be, or is that not allowed? What could be the possible reasons for the disproportionate amount of people from the ethnic minority communities found in the prison population and the psychiatric hospital population? I work in the mental health field where I feel a lot of people's human rights are just ignored. A and what happens whenever there's a challenge? Of course, the employers will get the best lawyers who can anytime take on a legally aided client's lawyers. And they don't get their human rights. Thank you. Kerry Hello. Dingle from World Right and World Bites. A uh, quick thing. I do agree with John's less law point. I am concerned that there is, it's not just about being out of touch with the public in terms of looking to the law, but there is a real contempt for the public. And all the drivers seem to be, let's avoid going to the public and go to the law instead and look to the judges. And my question is, how did this terrible shift happen? I think it's a very slippery anti-democratic slope. Because when you look historically, if you take something like the civil rights movement in America, there really were judicial, you know, judicial activists. There were legal activists, but very much part of a public you know, civil rights <coughs> movement. I'm not sure that we could now call them today judicial activists, just a disbelief in the public and therefore a looking to the law. On Strasbourg, I'll answer your question directly. I think the UK should comply, but it can comply very minimally. It can, it can for example, give, give the right to prisoners, give the, the right to vote to prisoners of six months sentence or less. What practical harm that would do to the rest of us, I do not know. I do not see why this is worth, even if you disagree with the judgment, I don't particularly feel strongly either way. I can see the argument side to side. I do not see that it's worth tearing up our human rights obligations because of one judgment that we don't like, that frankly doesn't do us any concrete harm and won't expose anyone to danger. I think we should comply for the sake of the integrity of the system, not particularly because I agree with the judgment, because you don't get to pick and choose what judgments you comply with. That's the rule of law. All I'd say on free speech <coughs> is that, certainly from an American perspective, yes, the European, the, the Article 10 of the Convention and, and the case law is relatively weak on free speech. All I can tell you as someone who's written an enormously long book analyzing every single aspect of British free speech against European standards is that, is that the accession to the European Convention, and particularly the Human Rights Act, has strengthened our free speech law. We lost a number of major cases, and in nearly every case that went to Strasbourg, that um, it was found that our law was illiberal and needed to, be, to give greater protection to free speech. And you won't find a single lawyer who knows they are a free speech that will deny that. So it may be that Strasbourg is imperfect, but it was better than, than our purely democratic system had been, up simply relying upon the laws passed by Parliament and the common law. Um, I wondered also, Gavin, whether you were the right person to answer the question about, the very big question about mm. what are human rights. A uh, woman was asking, you know, she's not really sure as a layperson what they actually mean, but there seems to be a problem with balance. Well, you, so. you could start with the Universal Declaration is a, fairly, is a fairly good list. Go and read it and try and stop the hairs on the back of your neck standing up when you read it. I would like, the other thing I would like to say before, before I'm painted as someone who just thinks we should run off to the courts and not try and fight these battles in the demos. Of course, ultimately, these, these, political, these, political, these battles must be won politically, and I wrote a piece about that on, a, on the conversation. In the end, if Parliament wants to, it can repeal the Human Rights Act. And if the UK government wants to, it can withdraw us from the European Convention on Human Rights. In the end, the battles are political and have to be won in the political realm. And I think academics now are much more getting out there and fighting. The organisation Lib Liberty and Shambhu Chakrabarti gets out there and every day fights the political fight for these rights. The point is simply whether we think in the end there should be something more than the will of a bare majority that protects our rights. But to, we have to win those arguments in the political realm, and that's partly why we're all here today, those of us who believe in rights and believe in the European system for protecting rights. We don't just go running to courts. We do have to fight for these rights. We have to fight for public belief and acceptance of these rights. I fully, so that's a, a good corrective, I think. John, um, what do you think about that? Is this is simply the last resort. It's not an avoidance. I mean, you had a lot of support there in the audience for... Um, your point of view, but um, isn't this really the last resort? There's still the political argument as well. Yes, uh, the way it's often posed is to say that there is now a collaboration between the political sphere and the judicial sphere. Um, that came across very clearly actually with what Lord Newberger said uh, when he made a speech in Australia this summer about the assisted suicide decision, the Nicholson decision, where he said, and I accept what you say there, Emily, but on, on one view you can say there was appropriate deference to Parliament. But, but, but my, my point about that is it, there, is no, there, there is no equality between, there should be no equality between 
politicians and judges. Um, it shouldn't be a question of deference. The, the judiciary should merely apply the law that Parliament has enacted, which of course it has enacted since the 60s, and it's been updated a number of times since. Uh, Parliament has decided the assisted suicide law shouldn't change, so there actually should be no scope for that matter going into the courts. Um, so when you talk about deference, to me the problem is not whether or not the judiciary defer to what Parliament has said. My, my problem is that the judiciary even have the ability to question what Parliament is doing. Um, that, 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 that's, that's the fundamental problem. And just on the, the question up there about what exactly are human rights, I, I can answer that very simply. Each of these articles set out in the European Convention is simply a gateway. It is a gateway for taking an issue from the political sphere and putting it into the, into the legal sphere. In other words, it is a means by which the judiciary can now make decisions about issues that they should not be adjudicating. Emily, I mean, please obviously comment on any of these points or questions, but there was quite a strong kind of current in the audience of saying there's an avoidance here of having a political argument. There's a sort of running scared of, at the moment, UKIP and um, <coughs> a sort of running away from the argument, which is where it should be had. And I wondered what you thought about that. But please, obviously, I mean, I, any of questions. I, I think that if we... Let's, let's paint a picture of what... Let, let's have a look at what it is that's, that's being suggested, and I, I hope I'm not being unfair in char characterising it in this way which is that whoever wins the election um, on, 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 what is it, half the people of the country who vote, who might win on 35% of that vote, should make every decision and they should be unchallengeable. And that the job, job of judges should be to interpret such laws as, the, as Parliament lays down. And to a certain extent, actually, that's what happens at the moment. <laughs> I mean, that's what happens. You know, we're the ones who passed the Human Rights Act and gave that power to the judiciary and said to the judiciary, because in the end, the thing about the, the lady who asked me a question about, um, about uh, or asked us questions about human rights, I mean, the, the decision in relation to, to what to do with the, the gay couple and the, and the religious um, landlord was absolutely, you know, there was there's one person's rights and another person's rights and how it is that we, that we find a resolution of that. Parliament can't answer that. Parliament can set down the principles, and then when putting them to life, a judge has to sit and weigh the bal you know, and balance one set of rights against another, and there will always need to be a compromise. There's, there's very few clear cases, but it does seem to me to be right that the, that the judiciary should be there to, to also, when looking at legislation that we pass, to be balancing that with other legislation that we passed, which was the Human Rights Act. And what worries me at the moment is that we're having a, a potentially a coach and horses driven through it. And I hear what's said, that there's no attempt to leave Strasbourg, but I just don't agree with that. Because I think that if the, if the Tories' Bill of Privileges gets through, as, I, as I've already said, there won't be any, there won't be, you won't have a right to challenge if it's a trivial case. If you're, if you're acting outside the law, so presumably that includes journalists trying to protect their sources, they're going to redefine what torture is and fear of torture. They're going to not allow the Human Rights Act to be used for people outside British territories. So, so I mean, there's one human rights case where a squaddie died of dehydration because of bad, you know, bad leadership, um, and his family took the case to, to, to court under the auspices of the Human Rights Act. That wouldn't be allowed anymore. I mean, there are a number of changes that are being made, and that is completely inconsistent with our continued membership of the, of the Convention. And it's already been said. That the, convention, that the European Court won't accept um, the, the proposals of the Tories. And so we are on our way out of the door, and we won't have the European Court of Human Rights anymore giving any sort of, of, uh, of judgments that will be of any relevance, which will then lead, I think, to opening the door to everybody else to leave too. And we used to be, as a post-colonial country, a post-imperialist country, we used to have a great, great reputation for promoting human rights around the world, for having a deference for international law. Actually, it's one of the things that we should be proud of as a nation. And the idea of us sullying our reputation in this way by, by abandoning Strasbourg, by undermining it fatally, I think it's, I think it's disgraceful. I, I mean, I genuinely... Th I'm not making political point. I think it's genuinely disgraceful that they're even suggesting this. <laughs>
Um, we'll have to change the ministerial code. The ministerial code says that you have to comply with international treaties and international law and your obligations. They'll have to change that. I mean, what kind of rogue nation will we end up being? Thank you. Anthony, I'm sure there's lots that you want to come. I mean, maybe we shouldn't get too swamped into the, in the sort of nitty-gritty of the changes. Um, I mean, obviously, please come back on anything. I was quite interested in the question about, you know, why has this happened now? Why is it that that might be something that you wanted to offer some views on? Well, firstly, can I, can I answer the, the straight question from the first question of uh, what should be done about uh, prisoners' votes? And my answer is unambiguous. Parliament should change our law by a sufficient amount, and it will only be a small amount, to achieve compliance with the Strasbourg decision. Uh, I think the Strasbourg decisions on prisoner voting are amongst the worst decisions they have ever given as a matter of law in terms of uh, forcing uh, a meaning on words which they do not have, of ignoring the principle in construing international treaties that working papers can be referred to to resolve ambiguities, where the working papers show absolutely clearly that specific language was chosen in the convention so that bans on prisoners voting were permissible. Uh, in terms of getting things factually wrong, saying that when Parliament enacted the legislation, it gave no consideration to the issue. That was factually wrong. There had been detailed considerations. It was, from every point of view, the prisoner voting decision was the worst decision they've ever come up with. Nonetheless, we should comply with it. And we should comply with it because we undertook a treaty obligation to implement decisions of the Strasbourg Court affecting the UK. And as a country in this globalized world, it is very much in our interests that countries should comply with international treaties. The whole world operates on international treaties, governing trade, all manner of things. And if we can't set an example of occasionally complying with something that we don't like and is stupid, then how can we expect other, other regimes to comply with treaty obligations that may be very onerous on them. So that's, that's my, my answer on that. And I, yeah, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with uh, absolutely agree on this with, uh, with, with, with the, the two on the other side of the platform. Um, uh, but the only other one I'd like to answer, answer the question is, is what are human rights? And I think this is, this is a, bit, uh, a bit, bit like one of those things you can, uh, you know, I always would have thought, it's a, it might be a little bit difficult to describe in one sentence, but you recognize it when you see it. I mean, last year, a girl in the Maldives was sentenced, to, a 15-year-old girl, was sentenced to 100 lashes for having had premarital sex. Right, I think we'd all agree that's not compatible with human rights. Mm, President Assad in Syria, the, what he's doing, I think we'd all agree that's not compatible with human rights. Western leaders go to China and they want to raise human rights. We all know what they're talking about. But then when the Strasbourg court tells us that it's incompatible with human rights, that this or that tiny detail of our law, it trivializes the concept of human rights. It undermines the vitality of the concept of human rights. I mean, that, that is a further reason why I am so frustrated with the Strasbourg court. Mm -hmm. So we want real human rights, not these trivial ones. Um, back out to um, the audience. The idea within a democracy of the, the tyranny of the majority. And the legislature, uh, sorry, the, the judiciary is a, an important check that we built into democracy mm. because democracy is a system that we all believe in, but it is very, very difficult to make laws which deal with all the trivialities when you are Parliament, when you are looking to all the people, and so you inherently make laws which contradict one another. So to say a, judici a judiciary should only apply the law misunderstands the way in which laws are made. And what a judiciary needs to do is look at what those competing laws are and find a way between them. And so one of the laws that we passed was going, uh, you know, su subscribing to a human, right, human rights law. And of course that deals with a huge vast array of things, 
and it's up to judges to deal with exactly those trivialities and to, because Parliament couldn't possibly go into what all of them are. Mm. And so I think um, it's not a question, sorry. I'd just, just like to make a point on the fact that laws aren't black and white, they're not clear cut, and it's, that makes it difficult to interpret the laws. So to say that judges or the role of the judiciary is to understand and interpret the law. That in itself is a complex thing, a complex issue. It's not easy to, we don't have codes where we look and we see what the problem is and what the rule is for every single situation. And even then, that doesn't mean that the law in itself is clear cut. So just, I think one of the things that uh, John raised, that judges should just be there to understand and interpret the law. I'd just like to ask, what exactly do you mean by that when the laws are not always clear in and of themselves? And also, um, you mentioned the point about um, something that differentiates the judiciary from politicians is the idea of consent and engagement with the public. Well, I'd like to ask you what you then think of the executive powers and whether we actually get to question some of the policies that they make mm. and how involved we are with the decisions that mm. they make and mm. who becomes the minister mm. and those processes. So mm. I think that the judiciary is a necessary check for some of the policies that are made by executive powers, especially when they're rush policies mm. to push through with some sort of political agenda. Mm. And the human rights of the people, the victims of those policies are not actually considered. Mm. I want to know how important you would say the role of the jury is in the context of the, this discussion in checking parliamentary rulings and the judiciary. Because I have to say I find it quite odd, um, uh, the disdain that politicians need to have for juries considering that in the modern political age, basically went into the focus group. It seems to me that the case uh, made against judicial activism and judicial review relies on two bases. Um, one of those is using examples, for examples like Anthony Gabe, which um, he presents as bad decisions. Um, in response to that, I'd like to quote two statistics. One, the government gave the statistic itself in its own case for restricting um, the right to judicial review. That was in 2007, um, out of the number of judicial review cases brought, only 3% were successful, uh, as in a ruling was made against the government or public authority. The other statistic, uh, 2012 cases before the European Court of Human Rights, 0.6% resulted in rulings against the UK government. Personally, I would look at those statistics and worry that the judiciary should be doing more. Um, my, my second point is about democracy, which was made by someone over there. And my question is, what would the panel define as, as democracy? Because there seems to be the, the, the second basis and underlying assumption seems to be that parliament represents democracy and majority voting pitched against the judiciary. Um, uh, another understanding of democracy might be but the, the two work in tandem to uh, Emily mentioned earlier about clipping the wings, I would say more policing the edges of the excesses of the legislature. Um, so my question is, what, 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 what is democracy? It's been a fascinating discussion, I suppose. I've got a question really about whether we've sort of put it the right way around. Coming out of the panel, there's been a lot of, sort of interesting examples of controversial issues, and I suspect none of those will make it into any major party's manifestos next year. Um, and I suppose what I'm getting at with that is, is this really a case of judicial activism that's happening? Or are judges actually, in many cases, rather reluctantly filling the void that politicians are leaving? Isn't that perhaps more the issue here? Isn't they, aren't the judges kind of getting a bit of a, a, a bashing in the press and things like that for, for really actually just stepping in where MPs are fearing to tread and maybe MPs should just frankly be a bit bolder? A bit bolder? Thank you. So in contrast to the last round, we had a bit more address to this side here. You know, you, recute, you were sort of, it was suggested that this was the tyranny of the majority, that actually laws aren't black and white, so how could the judges just simply enforce them? Most cases aren't successful, so, uh, and perhaps there's, you know, a a this is simply a necessary check, and then some harder questions as well. So um, any thoughts on any of those questions? Um, John, would you well, like to Well, start? I'm quite happy to pick up that point because I think you've made a very interesting point about um, whether or not judges are merely filling a void. I mean, actually, what the judges are doing is walking into territory that Parliament and politicians are giving them. I do not <coughs> see this problem as one of, of judicial land grab. Far mm. from it. Um, the, the fundamental problem here is, is, is in the political sphere because, whereas I was talking earlier about how politics is fundamentally about having the vision, seeing the big picture, what sort of society you want to have, our politicians are incapable of having that vision these days. 
they, they approach all of these problems in the same way that accountants and lawyers actually approach problems, by concentrating on minutiae. They don't feel the ability to present a programme to us, the public, which can garner popular support. So what they have instead of that, and this relates to the issue of judicial review, they actually seek cover for themselves. So like they engage in all these absolutely pointless consultations, which they know are pointless. I mean, I, my Twitter account has recently been bombarded with stuff from the MOJ about do I want to complain or do I want to make an issue about revenge porn? Well, no, of course I don't. But if I had experienced revenge porn, then I would. So obviously, the only people who are going to respond to this consultation are people who want the law to be changed on revenge porn. So then the MOJ comes forward and says 90% of our respondents wanted a change of the law on revenge porn. Therefore, it must be the right thing to do. Well, you know, that really does show a poverty of ambition and a, uh, a, a degradation of the whole political process. Um, and in, aside from the issue of consultations, I mean, that's why you get all these judicial reviews, because... Uh, politicians are, as someone else said, p passing laws which instead of actually establishing a straightforward principle actually just demasculate the executive in lots of bureaucratic red tape. So it's hardly surprising you get judicial <coughs> review after judicial review because then if the politicians can, can leave that judicial review with the thumbs up, they can say, ha-ha, at least the judiciary has supported what we're doing. Um, so the fundamental problem here is a political problem. I'd like to go back out to the audience, and if I'm going to manage to do that, we'll have to keep our comments fairly um, brief now. But Emily, basically what John's saying there is it's not judge, and some people in the audience are saying this, it's not judge's fault, it's your fault. I don't know what he's saying. He's just very angry at politicians, I have to say, because like, on the one hand, he, there seems to be this accusation that we don't pay enough attention to what it is that the public want, and then when we consult, he doesn't like the fact that we consult. You know, essentially, I mean, I mean, listen, I understand. Okay, well, you know, MPs are not popular. Government is not popular. I understand that. And I fully understand that the current favourite whipping boys are members of parliament, which is why it is so extraordinary that at such a time we are, you know, we are witnessing a, an, an onslaught on, um, on, the, on one of the other pillars of our democracy, which is the judiciary and the courts. Can I just pick up something about the gays in the military and what, what, was, being, what was being said recently about, you know, why is it that government hadn't, hadn't passed legislation in relation to gays in the military? And why is it that when there are holes in the, that there are holes in legislation? And I think that's kind of, it does, it does speak to a kind of an important part of our constitution which is, yes, legislation won't always cover everything. And yes, there may well be a judgment. I mean, why, why was it that Parliament didn't say it's about time that gay men and women were allowed to serve in the military? This is just ridiculous. We didn't. But the courts instead came out with that decision, and it was open to Parliament, if the public had wanted us to, to, to change the law in relation to that. But the public didn't want us to. And actually, whether the law comes from, from, the, from, from the judges and from our... Uh, I mean, we do come from a tradition of common law where the, we, you know, we shouldn't be so afraid of judge-made law. We have kind of always lived with that. And Parliament passing legislation and the two riding along, but in the end, Parliament being supreme with the idea that Parliament reflects the views of the public. That seems to me to be a balance that, that we still have in kilter. Um, and as for executive powers that you were raising, I think this is absolutely the point. The point is, is that you know, we used to have, I mean, the, the, again, the, the ideal is we have the judiciary, we have, we have the executive, and we have the legislature. But really, you know, when we have such a, a heavily whipped system where the executive is all powerful, where there's very little check on the power of the executive, the only power quite often is, is through the courts. And you know, that's, that's what we have. If we want to have a more powerful um, legislature, then we have another challenge. You know, how, how we re-establish the power of backbench MPs. Thank you. Um, Anthony, there was some disagreement with the views that you were putting forward in the audience. Um, is there anything you'd like to comment on? Um, well, <coughs> I mean, there are all sorts of interesting points are, are thrown, thrown up. Uh, can I just, just comment on, on one, which, which is a theme that's come up in, in, in quite, a, quite a number about the sense of uh, political structures failing, democratic mm -hmm. structures failing. Twenty years ago, shortly after the fall of the Iron Curtain, uh, there was a, a, a great feeling, I think, uh, all over Europe and all, all over the world, uh, that uh, democracy, representative democracy, was the unquestionably desirable way to run our affairs. And 20 years later, uh, all over, you can see in different ways senses of disappointment with representative democracy. Uh, 
The disappointment is manifested in all sorts, sorts of things. Parties that people are voting for now wanting to change various structures. In Egypt, uh, they want to put the generals in instead of democratically elected presidents. In other countries, they want to put religious leaders, uh, Muslim uh, imams, in to run things instead of uh, a dem democratic system. Here, here in England, we think, or a lot of people tend to think, that uh, democracy isn't working terribly well, so let's get the judges to make the decisions. Now, all those moves are moves in the wrong direction. If the legislatures and the democratic structures are not working quite as well as they should, then we really must, in a representative democracy, make them work better and not say we'll get someone else to do the job. So I absolutely agree, particularly with the lady in the third row, about problems of uh, laws that are pushed through without proper dis discussion and laws that are, that are un unclear. These are, these are real problems, but I, I feel that it, it's going down the wrong way to say get judges to do the right. The judiciary can only hold the respect that it needs if it is non-political and doesn't take controversial political decisions it's the legislative and democratic organs that we must concentrate on to get right. Gavin. Can I just say something about democracy? I'm really pleased that whoever, whoever raised that. And, and also to say something about the gentleman at the front who made his point about minorities being disproportionately mm. represented in prisons and um, <coughs> mental health mm. treatment. I mean, I think it's really interesting that we confront this, this squarely. You know, what is democracy? Because I think we're in danger of presenting there's either human rights or there's human rights and they're kind of against democracy. Or upholding human rights through judges is, is, is undemocratic. Mm -hmm. We must be careful not just to accept that. Mm -hmm. I mean, two points. First of all, democracy, human rights partly are the building blocks of democracy. Some of them are there. The civil and political rights are there because without them, we don't see how you can have a functioning democracy. Free speech... Um, public protest, fair votes, freedom of conscience, thought and religion, a degree of privacy so the state can't spy on you the whole time. Those are some of the most fundamental human rights we recognise, and without them we don't have a recognisable democracy. They are constitutive of democracy. So let's first of all not, not accept that human rights are, are counter-democratic. They are there because without them we don't think that you can have a functioning democracy. Without them you have, perhaps what we see in Russia, authoritarian populist democracies where there's no real check upon the government or where there is some kind of election. And the second point is, what, even if, if you grant that point, I think everyone would have to grant that point, what kind of democracy do we want? There are different versions. And, and the kind that I think John is talking about is what Ronald Walken calls statistical democracy, which is a decision is made simply if a bare majority supports it. Of course, remember in our electoral system, it never is a bare majority because you can comfortably have a majority in the House of Commons with 35% of the vote. <clears throat> but is it right that am I, what, what lies behind that assumption that, that, that what, the, what, the, what the majority wants goes is simply that minorities only have those rights which they can persuade the dominant and sometimes prejudiced majority to grant them. And if the, if the, if the majority doesn't feel like granting them those rights, then tough shit, basically. You don't get them, regardless of whether those opinions are reasonable or fair or based on some kind of prejudice. And that's not, for me, that, well, I don't recognize that as the only version of democracy. I recognize a version of democracy which treats all its citizens equally and that has some foundational principles within which lawmaking and within which political decision making works and they include basic human rights for all citizens. Thank you Gavin, that, that's so clear. Okay, this is the last opportunity. Um, so, and you will need to keep your comments very brief. I think the panel hasn't quite emphasised the extent to which the world has really changed. Um, I'll give a very trivial example, but I've been a governor at a local school for decades and on Wednesday we had to make a decision very like the judges are now having to make this is a school with a very, very, very liberal dress policy and presented with a pupil who wanted to wear a niqab. Now, we had to make that decision and there's incompatible rights there, which um, I, I can't remember all the decades I've been the governor making that sort of decision. And people of my age have grown up and seen homosexuality grow, go from being something illegal and disgusting to something which is celebrated and supported. Now, I'm happy with that. You know, some of my best friends and all that. But um, <laughs> the fact is, it's a difficult adjustment, and I can't help having some sneaking sympathy for people who have found that adjustment quite difficult to make. Thank you. Thanks very much. Anthony, for restoring my faith in the Conservative Party, having <laughs> trained lawyers. I just want to contextualise this debate perhaps a bit by recognising the fact, by sharing an anecdote perhaps, as Shami Chakrabarti explained to just explain why we're here today debating this issue, the European Court of Human Rights. 
And that is really the fact that the, in the Conservative Party, there is a pro-business lobby, which is very pro-Europe, and there is a backbenchers that are really worried about UKIP, and they are fighting over whether or not Britain should stay within the EU. And actually, this has been a deliberate attempt, perhaps, by certain politicians to have a debate with the other Europe, the Council of Europe, the European Court of Human Rights instead, and to shift the debate there instead so that they would avoid a, a split within the Tory party over the, U, the European Union. Just to take the debate to a different place about judicial activity, as opposed to just focusing around European and political issues, um, the Supreme Court was forced to make a judgment about who was and was not a Jew in the case of the Jewish free school. And we found ourselves in the alarming position, which seems to be growing, that the courts will start making a growing number of decisions about religious identity because that plays out in school admissions policies. Mm -hmm. Just wonder a quick comment about the sudden arrival of judicial uh, rulings in the sphere of religious communities. Mm -hmm. Interesting example. Okay, we're almost out of time, so I apologise to the people who did have their hands up who weren't able to speak. So, um, to bring in the panel, they have got one minute each, and so that really means just one, possibly two sentences, no more than that. Um, and I'm going to take them in the same order um, as before, so we'll start with Emily, then Anthony, then Gavin, and then finally John. So, Emily, one one minute, one sentence. <laughs> I mean, who'd be a judge? You know, you have to make a decision about who's a Jew and not, who's not a Jew. I told my husband, I explained to my husband, Christopher, that he was a Jew. He was very surprised. You know? <laughs> but, you know, it's very, it is, you know, in the end, that's, in the end, where there are holes, where there are, where, there were, where we need to have a, a, you know, patches to our umbrella, we need to rely on judges and we need to treat them with some sort of respect. It does seem to me that, as I said at the beginning, that actually if you ask the members of the public who it is, above all, that you would trust to make a decision, People will always say, I want an independent judicial inquiry. And, and the, we politicians have to rise to that challenge. You know, we are being outstripped, but it is not the w way of dealing with it to, to hand over political decisions to, you know, explicitly to the judiciary by asking them, I think, on too many occasions, for judges to make difficult decisions where we don't want to make those difficult decisions and then complain about other decisions when, they, when we believe that they're too political. I think we have to rise to the challenge. Thanks very much. Anthony, one sentence. A quarter of a century ago, uh, an instinctive reaction on coming across something that one really didn't like, maybe something utterly trivial like dog poo on the pavement, uh, was to say, there ought to be a law against it. <laughs> Today, increasingly, an instinctive reaction upon coming across something that someone doesn't like is, I'm going to get a lawyer to go to the Human Rights Court about this. I think it would be healthier if we got back to the attitude of mind that we had in the past. Spoken like a true conservative lawyer. Well, my, my final point would be to say, although courts decide human rights judgments, those judgments don't tend to work unless they eventually achieve recognition as being just. Mm -hmm. And the famous case of, of the Brown case in the United States in which the Supreme Court enforced desegregation so that black children went to school protected by federal police against screaming white white crowds. That eventually became to be seen and accepted by the population as an amazing judgment that, that brought justice to a, to, to a segregated South America. And so in the end, that's why it's important. You, you never just rely on courts. You never go running to the court and, you, and neglect the political realm. You always have to fight for the acceptance of human rights in the political realm as well, because unless, unless court judgments, unless human rights are seen to have political legitimacy and the public are engaged and debate them and accept them, then they won't in the end survive, whether it's particular judgments or whether it's whole system like the European Convention on Human Rights. Thank you. And finally, John. The whole um, problem of judicial activism is premised upon a contempt for the public. Uh, the whole idea be behind judicial activism is the idea that the majority will oppress the minority, that the strong will take advantage of the weak, <coughs> that the, the rich will rip off the poor. I fundamentally do not agree with that approach. I do not think that that is an approach to how people view these issues which is consistent with reality. So I think we ought to appreciate that is the view of humanity, namely you and me and the people out there, that the people who support judicial activism have. But there is a profound problem that arises if you start with that standpoint. Where does it end? If you cannot trust the public, then you cannot have democracy. You cannot hand political issues over to the public. 
for the public to decide. And what starts out as a campaign that, to take uh, an example given earlier, as a campaign to outlaw the whipping of young women who have premarital sex, ends up with the taking of those issues away from the public and putting them into the legal sphere on issues, the three issues I started with, assisted suicide, prisoners voting, welfare benefit reform. It is a problem that has no limits. The only way to impose those limits is by reviving the political sphere and putting an end to judicial acts activism. Thank you, and let's all um, congratulate. <laughs>